Stellar mass and intermediate mass black holes form when huge stars can't support nuclear fusion anymore and collapse, unable to withstand their own gravity. But it's not so clear with supermassive black holes. The mechanism of their formation is still unknown since there seem to be no stars large enough to directly collapse into such a giant black hole. Nearly every large galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, and our Milky Way isn't an exception. We've got Sagittarius A, which is pronounced Sagittarius A star. This space monster is mostly dormant and rarely wakes up to munch on gas and dust, and still, its mass is millions of times that of the sun. To be precise, almost 4.5 million times. There are still lots of mysteries surrounding mm. this black hole, but one of the most recent discoveries can also be the most exciting. But we'll get there later. Right now, imagine a distance of 14.6 million miles. It's like about 61 distances from Earth to the moon. That's the diameter of our supermassive black hole. Of course, it will look tiny compared to the Milky Way itself, which is 100,000 light years wide and 1,000 light years thick. But it's still impressive. At the same time, Sagittarius A is dwarfed by a disk of gas surrounding it. It extends for a whopping 5 to 30 light years and occasionally feeds the black hole. When it happens, faint flashes of X-rays are produced. The disk, known as the accretion disk, is also responsible for X-ray emissions triggered by friction. This friction can make the temperatures inside the disk go as high as 18 million degrees F. And now the coolest part, the supermassive black hole at the heart of our galaxy, is not just spinning, it's doing so at almost maximum speed, dragging everything close to it along for the ride. Scientists have calculated the rotational speed of Sagittarius A with the help of NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. Normally, the spin speed of a black hole is given a value from 0 to 1, with 1 being the highest rotational speed. Speaking of our supermassive black hole, its rotational speed is between 0 0.84 and 0 0.96. That's close to the top limit defined by a black hole's width. Now, the spin of a black hole is very different from that of other space bodies. Solid objects, like planets, moons, or asteroids, have physical surfaces. But black holes are regions of space-time surrounded by an outer, non-physical surface. This surface is called the event horizon, and even light can't escape beyond it. The rotation of a planet or a star depends on the distribution of its mass. At the same time, the rotation of a black hole is governed by its angular momentum. The extreme gravitational forces next to a black hole cause space-time to become slightly curved and twisted. It forms what we know as the ergosphere. This notion is unique to black holes and never occurs around relatively solid space bodies like planets or stars. In other words, when black holes spin, they twist up the very fabric of space-time, dragging along the ergosphere and everything it contains. This phenomenon is known as frame-dragging. Come to think of it, the name does make sense. Thanks to this dragging, we can observe weird visual effects around black holes. The theoretical maximum speed of a black hole is determined by how it grows after feeding on matter. As something falls into a black hole, it increases its spin. Plus, we should take into consideration the mass of a black hole. The more massive it is, the higher its gravitational pull is. And this makes it more challenging to increase the speed of the spin. Let me illustrate this idea. Our relatively not-so-heavy supermassive black hole, whose mass is equivalent to around 4.5 million suns, has a spin between 0.84 and 0.96, which is very fast. At the same time, a much heavier supermassive black hole at the heart of galaxy M87, which has a mass of 6.5 billion suns, is spinning just as fast. Between 0.89 
and 0.91. The solution to this mystery? This black hole is also feeding very rapidly, which allows it to increase its speed. To see one of the most significant astronomical events of all time, we go to South America. In the Atacama Desert, Chile, we find the most advanced technology for space observation. Here, the Royal Astronomical Community members watched for six months as a black hole simply absorbed a massive star. By the way, these are the same scientists who prove that in the center of our Milky Way galaxy is a supermassive black hole, and even took a photo of it. For the first time in history, this incredible event happened very close to Earth. Well, the distance of 215 million light years is considered quite close in astronomy terms anyway. Light from this event reached our planet in September of 2019, and even the most experienced scientists dropped their jaws in surprise. Imagine a star the size of our Sun, about 860,000 miles wide. Such stars have enough weight to create a strong gravitational field, holding many planets in their orbit. And now, let's place a giant black hole next to it. The hole is absolutely black, shaped like a disk, and weighs a billion times more than this star. The force of its gravitational field is incredible. Nothing can leave its gravity force. Objects that can move at the speed of light will still fall into this black abyss. Even light itself cannot escape its boundaries. As soon as a star enters the gravitational field of a black hole, it has no chance. At first, it tries to resist the pull of the black hole. Still, the star's outer layers begin to stretch toward the black hole, just like spaghetti. This is due to a powerful force of attraction. If you had the opportunity to extend your hand toward the black hole, hmm. you would see your fingers begin to stretch and elongate. This is because the force of attraction increases with every inch. Therefore, it acts stronger on your fingers than on your arm. That's why this process of pulling objects into a black hole is called spaghettification. The first thing to be sucked into the black hole is the star's crown. This is the outer shell of the star, which consists of hot plasma. You may notice how the star begins to shrink in size. This is because that plasma makes up most of the visible sun. When this hot plasma spaghetti reaches the black hole, it may appear to remain on the disk's edge and continue to orbit the black hole. But in fact, there is no turning back anymore. The star's particles have already hit the event horizon of the dark abyss. The gravitational field of a black hole bends light around its edges. So the event horizon looks a bit like a croissant for the observer. Boy, lots of food metaphors here. I'm getting hungry. You may also notice a kind of chaos in this ring, as if some light particles are moving in one direction and others in another. This happens because of a mirror effect. But you can be sure that whatever reaches the event horizon will, sooner or later, be pulled into the singularity, or the black pearl of the black hole. Another illusion you spot is the star particles in the event horizon moving slower. The truth is that supermassive objects like a black hole curve space-time around them. And the more massive the object, the slower time flows near it. If you hang one watch beside a black hole and another on a wall in your bedroom, you will see that the second hand in the first watch barely moves, while a whole day passes on Earth. As observers, it seems to us that the particles of light have slowed their movement. But in fact, they may have already been absorbed by the black hole ages ago. Now, massive streams of red-hot plasma splash into space, just like spaghetti sauce. <laughs> when a black hole has absorbed star material, it emits powerful rays of energy at a rate of about 6,200 miles per second. This release of energy is accompanied by an intense flash. It's thanks to this flash that scientists can even detect this process in the first place. This phenomenon can be observed when a supernova explodes. When nothing remains of the star's body, we can still see stardust and other particles in the black hole's event horizon. 
Kind of like the Parmesan cheese sprinkled on the spaghetti. Hey, stop me if I'm taking this too far. When the process of spaghettification is completed, about half of the star's weight has been thrown into outer space as dust and glowing particles. The other half was entirely absorbed by the black hole. The scientists observed this process for almost six months. But what would be more interesting is to dive into a black hole yourself. Well, we can't do that yet, but we can simulate this process. Here's a little drone, our metal friend, kind of like a meatball. No, I haven't had lunch yet. Right now, it's at a safe distance from the black hole, the length of about three widths of the event horizon. Objects at this distance can orbit the black hole safely. A little closer, and it'll be swallowed up by a dark infinity. So, our destroyed star could have safely existed at this distance. Moreover, planets can live at this distance. And if there is a suitable source of light and heat somewhere nearby, life can exist on these planets too. But our goal is the singularity, and we guide the meatball, I mean the drone, closer to the event horizon. After a few minutes, the force of attraction begins to strengthen, and the drone starts to stretch like spaghetti. When it begins spinning around the black disk, it means it has reached the event horizon and has started its descent into the black abyss. Now, let's look at everything from the drone's perspective. All the light from the stars that it sees becomes blue. This is called gravitational blue shift. As it falls into the black hole, its gravitational field pulls the photons of light down, giving them energy. Their wavelengths grow shorter, so the red photons change into blue. The drone continues to fall and is already completely hidden from our eyes. And all that the robot sees is a bright, thin blue beam. Now it's in complete darkness. There's absolutely nothing here, not even time. Here, time goes so slowly that our entire solar system could grow old and cease to exist during a minute spent in a black hole. But our drone will live until its battery is empty. Hey, the drone sees a small bundle of light again, and it's getting closer and more prominent. Now the drone will experience the same fall, only in reverse. Once the drone leaves the singularity, the heart of the black hole, it will be on the event horizon once again. The light from the stars gradually changes from blue to red. Then the drone is thrown into outer space, perhaps in some faraway galaxy. Well, returning from a black hole is just a theory. Some people think that black holes are a kind of wormhole that can lead us to distant places in space. But so far, these theories are considered fiction. Black holes are quite challenging to detect. The problem is they are, well, black, just like space. They don't emit light like stars, so they can only be detected by gravity anomalies. Despite this, scientists believe there are a vast numbers of black holes in our universe. They're born when a massive star collapses under its own weight. And given the infinite number of stars in the universe, black holes are probably a common phenomenon. Scientists believe black holes have their own lifetimes. This is because of Hawking radiation. A black hole loses mass, and so, to continue existing, it has to absorb massive objects, like the star we just watched. But if the black hole lives in deep space, it has less to absorb and will most likely begin to shrink until it just disappears. Like this plate of spaghetti. Mm. Castles were cold places in times past. The stone seemed to radiate the winter chill. This is one practical reason why tapestries were hung upon castle walls, to help keep the cold out and the warmth in. But you just can't hang any old thing on castle walls. It should be beautiful, heroic, with a heavy wow factor. The ancient Greeks hung tapestries on the walls of their castle of the sky. Glorious tapestries woven of stars. All 48 constellations of the Northern Hemisphere were designed and named by the Greeks. The story of Andromeda is one such tapestry. Woven of seven constellations spread across the entire autumn sky, the story contains detailed astronomical observations preserved as highlights in the sky tapestry. It begins with the constellation Cassiopeia, queen of the oldest realm in Africa, Ethiopia. When the constellation Cassiopeia is on the horizon, 
it looks like a staircase going up to the Milky Way. Step pyramids around the world are often thought to have been inspired by the constellation Cassiopeia. In any case, Cassiopeia is a beautiful constellation, indicating that Queen Cassiopeia was also a beautiful woman. She was good-looking, but equally vain, which sets off all the dramatic action. Cassiopeia can be found in the night sky opposite Ursa Major from the North Star. Like Ursa Major, Cassiopeia circles the North Star and is a circumpolar constellation. A supernova was observed in Cassiopeia around 1680 Earth time. Cassiopeia A having occurred about 11,000 years earlier. The Chandra X-ray satellite recently recorded an extraordinary photograph of this supernova remnant showing the elements sulfur, calcium, silicon, and iron amid the expanding cloud's high-intensity X-rays. Cassiopeia's husband is also a circumpolar constellation, a minor, dim one named Cepheus. He had his own kingdom. A merger of empires by way of marriage is something common throughout history. Cepheus was a king of Phoenicia. There were many kings of Phoenicia back in the days when Phoenicia was just a collection of city-states along the western shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Cepheus can be found in the area between Cassiopeia and the North Star. The constellation of Cepheus is important to astronomers. It's where Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered variable stars that pulsed at regular intervals. The rate of pulsation of the star indicates the true brightness of the star and enables a sure measurement of the distance to the star. The discovery of Cepheid variable stars was a major breakthrough for early 20th century astronomy. Cepheus and Cassiopeia had a daughter, Andromeda, also a noted beauty, about whom all the fuss is. It seems that one day Cassiopeia was boasting about the beauty of her and her daughter Andromeda. We are more beautiful than any other women in the whole wide world. Well, such pretension can be forgiven for a queen. But then Cassiopeia went further and stepped beyond all natural bounds. In fact, we are more beautiful than any of the Nereids. Well, the Nereids were Greek mythological sea nymphs, daughters of the ocean. Noted for their beauty and kindness to sailors, the Nereids, all 50 of them, took offense at being diminished, dissed, by a mere mortal woman. Cassiopeia had to be punished for exceeding the bounds of the civil order. By her excessive vanity, Cassiopeia transgressed beyond the bounds of nature, for which an unnatural punishment was inflicted upon the entire kingdom of Ethiopia. A monster from the bottom of the ocean, the constellation Cetus, began to devastate the coastal villages of Ethiopia as well as Ethiopia's fishing ships. Fittingly, Cetus is a constellation of the southern celestial hemisphere. The fourth largest by area of all the constellations, Cetus swims in a dark part of the sky called the ocean, with only its head rising above the celestial equator. This part of the sky contains several water-themed constellations. Pisces, the fishes, Aquarius, the water bearer, and Eridanus, the river. Over 50 exoplanets have been discovered in Cetus. You can bet the James Webb Space Telescope will have a field day analyzing the spectra of these planets' atmospheres, looking for signs of life. Meanwhile, Queen Cassiopeia and King Cepheus must do something about the monster devastating the shores of Ethiopia. They consult an oracle and make another trespass beyond the realm of reason and nature. Tell us, oracle, what can we do to stop the monster from ravaging our kingdom? This monster is not a normal affliction of nature. An offense was committed against the higher realms, and this is the punishment. The monster cannot be stopped by any normal means. Only a human sacrifice of the noblest being may placate the beast. One error compounds another. The noblest person in the kingdom, of course, is Princess Andromeda. According to the command of her father and the consent, or perhaps a suggestion of her mother, Andromeda is chained to a rock offshore. She is the human sacrifice that her parents hope will save the kingdom. Wow. Da -da -da -da. Here comes the Greek hero to save the day, stop the human sacrifice, and turn Cetus to stone. Perseus. Now, where is Perseus coming from? According to legend, the Hebrides. Perseus went to the Hebrides in pursuit of the Gorgon Medusa. The geological scope of this tapestry is incredible. From the Hebrides to the Red Sea, 
The Hebrides are an archipelago of mostly rocky islands off the western coast of Scotland. It was impossible to sail any further. The Hebrides were the absolute end of the world. Perseus didn't have to sail to the Hebrides. However, he flew on a pair of winged sandals. Hey, way to go, Perseus! Now, Medusa was one of the all-time baddies. One look at Medusa was so terrifying it would petrify you, literally turn you to stone. Perseus was in great danger. So, what did our hero do? Instead of looking at Medusa, Perseus used the scientific principle of reflection. He slew Medusa by seeing her reflected in his polished shield. In our sky tapestry, Perseus is portrayed holding up the severed head of Medusa. In the night sky, one eye in Medusa's head opens and closes and opens again. Arabic astronomers named the star Algol, the ghoul. Algol is an eclipsing double star. One star is bright, the other one, not that much. As the dimmer star orbits the bright star, it passes in front of the bright star, eclipsing it, and the eye closes. Since the dim star takes 2 days, 20 hours, and 49 minutes to orbit the bright star, the eye in Medusa's head opens every day and a half or so. The constellation of Perseus is immediately below Cassiopeia, and sky watchers quickly look to see if Algol is eclipsed, if Medusa's eye is open or closed. Perseus flew back from the Hebrides, accompanied by Pegasus, the winged horse. The central part of Pegasus is the great square, made up of four stars. As Earth goes around the Sun, the great square is right in the center of the night sky in autumn. In the summer, the summer triangle of Vega, Deneb, and Altair are in the middle of the night sky. In spring, it's Leo the lion, and in winter, it's Orion the hunter. These are the walls of the castle in the sky, and all have marvelous tapestries adorning them. The constellation of Andromeda shares a star named Alpharetz with Pegasus. It's one of the corners of the great square, so it appears Andromeda may be riding on Pegasus. Her crown, remember she is a princess, is floating nearby. M31, the Andromeda galaxy. To see M31, cross the corners of the great square from the lowest star to the uppermost star, and then go a little further to see the Andromeda galaxy. Be sure to peek at it from the corner of your eyes. It's called averted vision. The corners of your eyes are more sensitive to light, so you'll be able to see the huge spiral galaxy 2.5 million light-years away as a smudge of light one and a half times wider than the full moon. Now, Perseus doesn't go in for human sacrifice, so he stops it and saves Andromeda by exposing Cetus to Medusa's gaze. And here we encounter the second eclipsing variable in our sky tapestry, Mira, the heart star of Cetus, the sea monster. Mira, from which we get the English word mirror, so fitting in a story about vain beauty, is an eclipsing double star. The dim star orbiting the bright star is a white dwarf, not bright enough to see with the unaided eye. The effect is that Cetus' heart shuts off. Mira is eclipsed and disappears. This cycle repeats itself every 332 days. Our fabulous star tapestry has the only two eclipsing binary stars visible to unaided eyes, the nearest spiral galaxy, and a hero that doesn't like human sacrifice and uses the scientific principle of reflection to thwart mythological monsters. Wow, I would hang that in my castle too. Just saying. <laughs>